Thank you and good evening everybody. As somebody who has spent 20 years of his life uh, campaigning again and again and again in election after election, trying to put the case that there was something wrong with this European project and it's about time after all these years that the British people had a say again, because after all the last one wasn't really all that fair, was it? Because my parents' generation were asked whether they wanted to be part of a common market, an EEC. But that, of course, had changed to an EC. And then it changed to an EU. So having spent 20 years battling and fighting for us to have this referendum, I'm pleased and proud to say that without us, it wouldn't have happened and bring it on. And, it's, and it is. It is, as our chairman said earlier, it will be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Because mark my words, if we vote to remain inside this union, they will never give us another opportunity. So it's an opportunity that we must grab with both hands. But remember that the referendum is, of course, on our renegotiated package. Important to remember that. Mr Cameron, who stood up and made that speech at Bloomberg. Do you remember the high vaunting ambitions from the Prime Minister? He was going to get fundamental treaty change. He was going to negotiate powers that came back to Britain. He was going to get reform of the European... I mean, the whole thing sounded pretty good, really, didn't it? I mean, many of you could have voted for it, perhaps, had he achieved these things. No, it sounded wonderful. It sounded ambitious. And he then launched, in the last few months, a Phileas Fogg-style tour of 27 <laughs> European capitals, the big diplomatic push for Britain to get a great deal. And what did he get last week? A grubby piece of paper from Donald Tusk that frankly gave us nothing that we didn't have before. Some vague idea that as we're outside the Eurozone, we won't get punished for it. And a red card, how about that? Did you see that on the you know, front page of the newspapers? We've got a red card. The British Parliament can now block EU legislation. Wow, I thought. He really has pulled something out of the hat here, hasn't he? Until you realise that actually the red card means that if a majority of the member states wish to block a law that comes from the European Commission, they will be able to do so. My goodness me, if they couldn't do so, it would be a communist dictatorship, wouldn't it? And in fact, that red card has existed for the last 10 years anyway that at the Council of Ministers, a blocking majority can stop a piece of law. So as far as I'm concerned, the red card is no more than a red herring. And this vague idea that we somehow won't be committed to ever closer union. Well, we won't be committed to it, but we're also not exempted from it, you'll notice. And actually, every single piece of law that is passed in Brussels, every single directive, every single regulation that is made by that massive bureaucracy in Brussels, every single one of them, gives Brussels more power. So please do not believe there is some line in the sand. And that actually, if we vote to remain, we will not be subject to any further centralisation. We will. The aim of the European project is they want to homogenise us. They want to harmonise us. God help us, they even want to pasteurise us. <laughs> and they want to turn us into some brand new European identity. It simply doesn't work and it doesn't stand up to scrutiny. But the big one, the big one from Cameron's renegotiation is of course that we've now got an emergency break. How about that? An emergency break. So Brussels is telling us, is giving us the permission that we may be able to change our benefit laws for migrants in a very minor way. Isn't that a big deal? Aren't you impressed by that? Come on, what's the matter with you? 
Well, this, this was the Prime Minister's trump card. And then you examine it and you realise that actually an emergency break has existed since 1994. You realise that far from stopping benefits for four years, it'll be tapered so that at the end of four years, benefits will be just as high as they were before. Then you realise that if he even wins the referendum, the European Parliament has the power and probably would veto it. So you realise it would take at least a year to put into place. You realise that before that year is up, there would be probably the biggest migrant tide we had yet seen come to this country. And at the end of that four-year period, even if he gets it passed, benefits will be back, index linked of course, to where they are today. And because our minimum wage is going up to a maximum wage, and because that is available to all EU citizens, that if Mr Cameron wins this referendum, by 2020, I can predict with total and utter confidence that yet more people than ever before will be coming to this country. And that means that, frankly, the only way I can frame Cameron's renegotiation is that it is Cam's sham and it must be rejected. <clears throat> now we had a bit of a bad time because the snap poll showed that 70% of the public thought he'd brought back a pretty dismal, dreary deal. But he decided to fight back. Indeed he said, this deal is so good that with it I would now vote for Britain to join the European Union. Now let's have a think about that for a moment, shall we? Let's imagine we weren't members of this European club, but the question on the ballot paper on June the 23rd was, do you wish to join the European Union? I wonder what the Prime Minister would say. He'd say, ladies and gentlemen, I am recommending that we join the European Union. Oh, I know that for the last thousand years we've managed to govern ourselves, but wouldn't it be just so much better if a foreign bureaucracy backed up by a foreign parliament now made 75% of all our laws every year? That'd go down well, wouldn't it? And he could add to that, I know you're used to the idea that the ultimate arbiter of law in this country is our own Supreme Court in London, but I've got a much better idea. Why don't we give the power to be the highest court in the land to a group of people in Luxembourg who aren't even judges? That'd go down well, wouldn't it? <laughs> he could say, look, I know that we've got 200 miles of the North Sea, which is our exclusive economic zone, but really, this fishing industry is desperately outdated. Wouldn't it be marvellous if we shared our territorial waters with our European neighbours and put tens and thousands of people out of work? That wouldn't go down very well, would it? And what if he said, look, I know that 200 countries in the world control their borders and decide who can come into their country. Indeed, many countries say that if you want to be an immigrant, you've got to have a skill or a trade to bring, you mustn't have a criminal record, and you need to bring your own health insurance for the first few years. And I know that we've been like the other 200 countries, being very strict about who can come to Britain. But here's a fantastic idea, folks. Would you please embrace this? We've now decided we're going to open up our borders to 500 million people, and any of them can come regardless whether they have criminal records, and we're going to turn the National Health Service into the International Health Service. It wouldn't sell, would it? <laughs> and for all of that, folks, for all of that, we're going to pay a membership fee of £55 million a day. We know what the answer would be, don't we, in those circumstances. But actually, <laughs> that is what we are being asked to endorse. At no stage in the last 40 years and more have our political class ever dared 
tell us the truth about this project. And as we know the disadvantages, what they're now trying to do is to scare us. Did you hear Cameron today? If we left the European Union, our border issues would get worse, not better. I mean, you couldn't make it up, really, could you? <laughs> that the jungle at Calais would suddenly be in Folkestone. Well, aside from the fact that the deal with France is nothing to do with the European Union, it's a bilateral deal between our two countries, the fact is, if we controlled our own borders, we could just say no to people, couldn't we? We could just say no to people. If you want to claim asylum, claim it where you come from. And of course, and of course, they're lining up to tell us that unless we were part of this European club, we couldn't trade with them. Indeed, millions of people would lose their jobs. The sun might not rise the next morning. We'd all be living in caves, and they're lining up to tell us this. Kenneth Clark, in his mid-70s, is now appearing on television at more than at any stage in his entire career. <laughs> and, Clark, <coughs> and Clark always predicts doom for the nation, unless we were controlled by these foreign bureaucrats. And of course, we now see the ubiquitous Peter Mandelson. What was that? I didn't hear that. <laughs> and what about Tony Blair? Telling her, well, there you are. It always works. I should end on the best note, Chairman, really, shouldn't I? But Tony Blair, and they're all lining up, and we're getting Goldman Sachs, and we're getting JP Morgan, and many of the banks who were allowed, in fact, to drag our economies into such misery back in 2008. And they're all lining up to tell us that if we weren't part of this political union, we couldn't trade with France and Germany and Italy and the rest of Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, it is total and utter hogwash. Every single country in the world has the ability to sell its goods into the European market. Last year, the Chinese sold 300 billion euros worth of goods into Europe without being a member of the European Union. The Americans sold 200 billion pounds worth of goods, uh, no, euros worth of goods, into the European Union last year without being members. And I don't know whether you've noticed, but on the streets of Bolton, and Manchester and elsewhere, there are lots of Mercedes, aren't there? And Audis, and BMWs, and Volkswagens, though people have now taken the labels off so they can't be identified. <laughs> and we get this rubbish, oh, the car plant in Sunderland wouldn't be able to export any of its cars to Europe if we weren't members of this political club. They sell us a million motor cars a year more than we sell them. The people absolutely insisting that Britain was to sign up to a simple, straightforward trade deal would be the German car manufacturers, would be the French wine producers. And we've got to recognise that we trade with the EU at a deficit of £60 billion pounds every single year. £60 billion. Pounds. They need us far more than we need them, and we must not be scared by career politicians. Oh, I forgot Kinnock. I forgot Kinnock. How could I forget Kinnock? How could I forget Kinnock? You know the chap. The chap who said we should, we should leave the common market and we should abolish the House of Lords, who went on to become a European Commissioner and now Lord Kinnock. Don't you just love people like that? <laughs> oh, we've got, we've got a career professional political class, many of them, like Lord Kinnock, on good EU pensions, trying to frighten the pants off us, and we must tell them to go to hell because we know Britain can stand on her own two feet and trade with Europe and trade with the rest of the world. Of course we can. <clears throat> it
in fact, in fact, when it comes to trading with the rest of the world, we might just be able to do rather better than we are at the moment. And very few people know this. But despite the fact, as Stephen said, we're the fifth or sixth biggest economy in the world, as a member of this European club, we are banned from making our own trade deals with anybody else in the world. Isn't that extraordinary? We're banned from making our own trade deals. Trade on the global stage for Britain has to be negotiated by an unelected commissioner in Brussels. The sort of people I've given such a warm welcome to over the course of these last few years. And, and that is truly remarkable. But something bigger than trade, something bigger than economics, perhaps something even bigger than the absolutely crucial question of controlling our borders struck me about 18 months ago. But 18 months ago, in the run-up to the European elections, Nick Clegg, do you remember him? <laughs> Nick Clegg challenged me to a head-to-head -head debate, should Britain stay or leave the European Union? And we did this head-to-head -head debate, and I think at the end of it, I'd probably enjoyed it rather more than he had. And midway through that first debate, the first of two, Nick said, and he came out with a line, and it's the same line that Cameron uses, it's the same line that many Labour politicians use, in fact it's the line that we've heard now for a few decades, that Britain isn't big enough, Britain isn't strong enough, Britain isn't capable and able to negotiate her own trade deals on the world stage, because we're dealing with big countries like India or China or America or the emerging nations like Brazil. Britain isn't big enough on our own to survive on that global stage. And I responded by saying, well, Nick, actually, earlier this year, the Chinese, si sorry, the Icelandics signed their own trade deal with China. And if Iceland, with a population of 320,000 people, is big enough and strong enough to sign its own trade deal with China, I'm damn certain we're big enough and strong enough to sign a trade deal with whomsoever we choose. Simple, straightforward, easy point. But it was at that moment, and I'll never forget it, and, it was, and I looked at Nick, who studiously, throughout both debates, never once looked at me and stared into the middle distance. But I looked at Nick and I'd listened to the tone of his voice and it suddenly struck me what Clegg meant, and what Cameron meant, and what Mandelson and Blair and all of them still mean. Ladies and gentlemen, it isn't that they don't think we're big enough. It isn't that they don't think we're strong enough. The fact is, our leaders don't think we're good enough. They don't think we're good enough to make our own laws in our own parliament, to judge with a proper immigration system who should live in our country, to stand up on the world stage and make our own trade deals. They don't think we're good enough. Well, I believe in Britain, and I think we are good enough to run our own country. <laughs> and in the end, in the end, that's what this referendum will come down to. You will hear economists saying to you, we'll be worse off. You'll hear economists saying to you, we'll be better off. You'll hear all sorts of arguments that ebb and flow in this referendum campaign. But the key thing you must decide, ladies and gentlemen, is do you think we're good enough? And if you think we're good enough, you know the right way to vote. I know we're good enough. I'm certain we're good enough. But this sheer negativity is all we will get from the Remain campaign. If you see the first leaflet they put out to 10 million houses, there is not a single ray of sunshine in it. All it does is tell us how awful life would be if we weren't governed by Mr Juncker and all these extraordinary people in Brussels. They will fight a wholly negative campaign. We must fight a wholly positive campaign. And frankly, my view, 
My view, and we heard previous speakers talk about what those that went before us had risked and in many cases sacrificed so that we and the rest of Europe could be free, independent, democratic nations. And yet in the face of that, what they have done is they have literally given away our country. And I want my country back. I want my country back. Do you want your country back? Do you want your country back? Do you want your country back? We want our country back. Join with me. We want our country back. Are you listening, Mr Cameron? We want our country back. Thank you. Very good.